I'd like to first recognize Almighty God, and secondly, Madam Chair, Vice Chair McCauley, Ranking Member Craig, and the Honorable Members of the Committee. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak today in support of Senate Bill 22. As mentioned last week, I was actually visiting a housebound individual for five hours while you were hearing testimony, individual that greatly needed someone to talk to and spiritual advice. I'm the pastor of two parishes in Ohio, but I'm speaking here on my own behalf and on behalf of hundreds of people I know throughout the state who have been seriously affected by the mandates and restrictions, both individually and their businesses. I'm a doctor of a different kind than the doctors that just spoke. I'm a physician of souls. And I see the spiritual harm, the emotional harm that many have suffered the last 11 months, perhaps in a way far greater than the medical doctors see it. And it is indeed great. And in large part, it is not because of COVID itself. It is because of the restrictions, the mandates, the worrying about their jobs. And, you may, and these, these hundreds of individuals that I know feel as, they have, as though they have had no voice. They have had no voice in a committee such as this because there was no committee where they could speak before the mandates were issued. They had no voice through their elected representatives because the legislature was deprived of a voice in those mandates. And you may say, why do, why do I care? As a priest, churches were not closed. Yes, but the governor shamed churches, such as my own two parishes, that remained open in March and April, saying or implying it was not an unchristian thing to do and that we were putting lives at risk. And when you look at the graph of COVID cases from March and April, cases and deaths, and you compare it with the graph, the spike we had this fall, it is a blip in the radar. If it was unchristian and unresponsible to keep the churches open then, then it is way more unchristian and irresponsible now for churches and businesses to be open. And besides, it is immoral to stand by when others are suffering and say, well, it doesn't apply to me. Perhaps some Germans did that during the Holocaust. I'm not a Jew, they say. It doesn't apply to me. I've also spent the night in a hospital parking lot in the car because waiting for a change in staff to see a dying man because the woman in charge at the time would not even let me wait in the waiting room while he was in a surgery where he could have lost his life. because she was more concerned about me getting COVID when I am at very little risk, in fact, I've had it, than concerned for his soul. And she literally told me, we have many that die without the priest, and that's just the way it is. Medical professionals are allowed to do their professional work. I am not allowed to do my professional work. I've been refused entrance. The governor's orders back, the initial orders, did not allow clergy to visit except in cases of danger of death. Now, I've submitted written testimony that has documented extensively exact quotes and references. I encourage the members of the Senate to look at it if you would like to verify my claims. What is up for discussion here is not whether or not the COVID restrictions and mandates were good in themselves but whether or not it is right for emergency powers to continue for 11 months that greatly affect individuals and businesses. And there are two ways to look at that. One is to see historically over the last 11 months whether it has in fact been good for these important decisions to be exercised by one or two individuals, the governor and the director of health. And secondly is whether or not they even legally should have that power. As far as historically, we now know lockdowns were a bad idea. They do far more harm than good. The World Health Organization acknowledges that. The study that Dr. Acton referenced to support shutdown had good data in it, 
from the 1918 flu, but she didn't even follow the data. That study itself stated that shutting down too early is harmful, and it gave parameters for when you should shut down, and we were nowhere near those parameters when she shut down the state. Secondly, to shut down, we shut down earlier and harder than just about any state in the country. One reason was Dr. Acton claimed we had 100,000 cases in Ohio. And she stated on March 12th that this was, that we knew this, that we had at the very least, she said, 100,000 cases. And nobody knew where she got that math. It went viral, nationwide, international, and nobody knew. There were respected scientists whom, uh, who are not conservative at all. Professor Carl Bergstrom, Dr. Trevor Bedford, who advised the state of Washington on COVID response. They said, we have no idea where she's getting this 100,000 claim. The data doesn't support it. The, and, but Dr. Acton claimed that it was, she received that information from experts far more knowledgeable than her. And whenever the governor was asked about it, he always said, Dr. Acton's the expert. I rely on her judgment. No question of the number. But the very next day, Dr. Acton, in the public press conference, gave the source for that number. And we found out that it was actually not from experts. It was her own math. And not one expert in that room caught several grave errors that she made when she explained her math. The worst of those errors was that she based her math on a faulty understanding of the model of Harvard professor Mark Lipsitch, who had said in his estimate, in his model, 40 to 70 percent of the world would get COVID in the course of the entire pandemic, over 12 to 18 months. What Dr. Acton did is misunderstand that model completely, and she did her math based on assuming that instead of 12 or 18 months to get 40 to 70 percent of people with COVID, that it would happen in one month by the middle of April. That is the math she gave. That means she was stating on public television that 7 million Ohioans were going to get COVID in one month by mid-April. That is not reasonable, and not one expert called her out on it, and there was no checks and balances. The Senate could not override those orders, could not even question them. And then we knew there was a problem in nursing homes, and that problem was not addressed. The few times I've been in nursing homes, I see things, I wonder, why is the governor chasing down bars and restaurants? when this kind of thing goes on in the nursing home. I know multiple nurses who were made to work when they were clearly symptomatic for COVID for seven to 10 days because the nursing home would not test them until the regular weekly test date. And then it took three more days to get the test. By the time they were forced off work into isolation, they had practically passed their contagious period. That is unreasonable. But here the governor and the health department are putting restrictions on bars and restaurants and people. And Dr. Acton stated at one point that only 22% of deaths were from nursing homes, when in reality it was 79. Regarding the masks, Dr. Thomas stated that they have eliminated the flu to a large extent. I encourage the senators to reference the May policy report of the CDC, where a very good and detailed study was published to the contrary regarding flu. Regarding COVID, the governor stated in June that it would be four to six weeks and we would run this to the ground by masks. But in point of fact, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, whom Dr. Vanderhoff and the Ohio Department of Health would no doubt consider a very prestigious authority on these matters, stated that that claim was irresponsible and not based on science. And what we have seen, we were promised that that would save lives in Ohio, yet, I don't know if anybody noticed, we caught up to Sweden in death count 
over the fall. We had thousands more deaths in Sweden where they were not wearing masks. And now, since the end of November, our death count has equaled that of Sweden's, and we have near equal population. You can look at Czechoslovakia as well, where they did wear masks from the very beginning. And they were hailed as a great mask success story in June. And at the time, I said to someone, wait till later. They will have their cases, and in fact, they have. And despite having equal or slightly less population than Ohio, they have 17,000 deaths from COVID now versus our 11.7 thousand deaths. As far as the question of whether the governor should have these emergency powers, the answer is simply no. An emergency power is for when you need to act, when there's not time to act. You don't have time for the legislative sessions. But in fact, you have had plenty of time. You've met in session multiple times. There is no reason why an emergency power needs to extend for 11 months. And I will conclude by saying, if you had a doctor who told you you needed a leg amputation, and the doctor said, but this is an emergency, you're not allowed a second opinion. If the doctor said, you're not allowed a second opinion for 11 months, I'm the only one allowed to make decisions for you for 11 months. And you're not allowed to know the reasons for this amputation until 90 days after the amputation is done. That's actually what, on April 7th, that's what the health department responded to a public documents request. You can see it in my written testimony. That would be unreasonable. It would be unfair to the patient. And I believe what has been done with the abuse of emergency power is unfair. I pray that it will be reversed and you make the proper decisions. Thank you.